If you have your Bibles with you, you can turn to the book of Daniel. We've been studying the book of Daniel um, this summer, and we are in Daniel chapter 9 this morning. As I think um, we have shared um, on previous Sundays, Daniel's one of the unique books um, for lots of different reasons, um, partly because it's hard to understand. It's like the book of Revelation. It's filled with, with language and, and prophecies that sometimes are beyond our ability to fully comprehend. Um, but it is one of those books that also is helpful to us because it speaks to, to us in terms of our day and age. Daniel, as we've said, um, is a piece of redemptive history. It is therefore a part of the gospel, and we've already seen the gospel in the book of Daniel. It's a piece of resistance literature in that it um, helps us to understand that there were believers in days gone by that lived in pagan cultures, and yet they hoped and trusted in God, even as we today live in a culture that is not uniquely Christian, and we hope and pray that God would be with us and work within us. This is a passage that also gives us a bigger view of the gospel. Sometimes we think of the gospel as me and Jesus. And me and Jesus, and um, Jesus saves me from my sins, and he does that. But God's vision and plan for the world is much bigger than just me and my personal salvation. God, when he created the heavens and the earth, created the heavens and the earth, so all of creation gave God's glory. And God's plan is to redeem us so that we might work in creation, so once again, all of creation, as we've said, even the pots in the kitchen might sing holy unto the Lord. And so Daniel is one of those books that gives us the big vision of what God is doing in the world. And so when we come to Daniel, we, we catch some of that vision in his words and this morning even in his prayer. Let me read to you this beautiful prayer. <clears throat> Let me begin with verse 4. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with all who love him and obey him, obey his commands. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and princesses and our fathers and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The men of Judah and the people of Jerusalem and all Israel, both near and far, and all the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you. <coughs> o Lord, we and our kings, our princesses, and our fathers are covered with shame because we have sinned against you. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servants of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. You have fulfilled the words spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing upon us great disaster. Under the whole heaven, nothing has ever been done like what has been done to Jerusalem, just as it is written in the law of Moses. All this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. The Lord did not hesitate to bring the disaster upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we have not obeyed him. Now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand and who made for yourself a name that endures to this day, we have sinned, we have done wrong. O Lord, in keeping with all your righteousness, your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, <coughs> your holy hill. 
Our sins and the iniquities of our fathers have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. Now, our God, hear the prayer and petition of your servant. For your sake, O Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, O God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make request of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. O Lord, listen. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hear and act. For your sake, O my God, do not delay, because your city and your people bear your name. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, we give you thanks this morning. We give you thanks for this book of Daniel that sort of opens our eyes to what you are doing in all of creation for all time. And this morning, as we come to this beautiful prayer, help us to understand our own sin, individually and as a nation, and help us to be a people willing to repent. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> I suppose most of you know John uh, James 5.16 that says, the prayer of the righteous man availeth much. It reminds us that those who have a relationship with God, who trust in God, that their prayers, when heard by God, can change things. But we tend to forget the first part of that verse. Do you remember the first part of that verse? Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you might be healed. If we were to ask what kind of prayers are effective, James says it's those prayers where we confess to each other that we're sinners, that we share with each other the ways that we have sinned against God. And whenever we dare to come clean with God, whenever we dare to share our faults, our failures, our personal sins, whenever we dare to start stop playing games with God and with each other, and when we confess, as we've just read Daniel confesses, I'm a sinner, then God hears and answers our prayer. Daniel 9 records one of the most powerful, perhaps the most powerful prayer in all of Scripture. I urge you to go home this afternoon or this evening and read again verses 1 through 19. Perhaps even take time this week devotionally to begin your devotion time just reading those verses 1 through 19 this week. I think as you read those verses, God will enable you to come before him in an attitude of prayer like you've never done before. This morning we're going to take a look at Daniel's prayer. It can be broken into four elements. And then we'll take a brief look at the words of the angel Gabriel that come at the end of this chapter that talk about the 70 times seven weeks. And we will try to make some short sense of that. But I want to begin and spend most of our time talking about this prayer. There are four parts, the adoration of God, the confession, the agreement with God, and the concern and petition for God's honor in verses 16 and 19. First of all, the adoration that we find in this particular prayer. David begins in a spirit of worship. He says, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and love with all who love him and obey his commands. It's verse 4. David wrote this when he was probably around 82, maybe 85 years old in the year 5. 38 BC. The beginning of this chapter says that he went to this prayer after reading the book of Jeremiah. And he was reading the book of Jeremiah in the 25th chapter, verses 11 and 12, that talks about how God is going to take Judah, because of their disobedience, into Babylon, 
and that they are going to be held there in Babylon for 70 years. And so as soon as he reads the book of Jeremiah and understands that the reason they're in Babylon is because of their sin, he goes to the Lord in prayer. Now, you might have thought that he, when he read the book of Jeremiah, and if you do your math, he is now in his early 80s, that that 70 years is almost up. And so he may have been tempted to do the math and say to God, listen, God, I'm reading this prophecy, Jeremiah 25. We've got seven more years. You better come through. But that's not what he prays. And that's not where he begins. He begins by saying, Lord, you are an awesome God. Daniel's foundation of hope doesn't lie in the fact of whether or not they go back to Jerusalem. David's hope lies in, as Herbie was talking about, the mercy of God. And because his hope doesn't lie in whether or not they go back to Jerusalem, but in the mercy of God, he begins his prayer by saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love. And then he goes into the second part of his prayer, which is the confession, which you find in verses 4 through 11. You know, when I first read this several years ago, and when I reread, reread it this past week, I'm struck by the archaic words. You don't hear prayers like this today. To be honest, I certainly typically don't pray like this. When you look at this prayer, look at the words that he uses. I've sinned, I've done wrong, I've acted wickedly, I've re we've rebelled, we've turned away, we've transgressed, we've not listened, we've refused to obey. And perhaps the strongest language comes in verse 7. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. Today that would be politically incorrect to talk about shame. You would think some of the candidates running for president for the nomination in either party would sometimes, with some of their comments, be filled with shame. But in our culture, we've seen it all. We've heard it all. Nothing bothers us anymore. We, we have no shame. You walk into an elementary school in America today, you hear young children using four-letter words. No shame. It's commonplace. We don't blush. We're not embarrassed because we've seen it all. We've heard it all. And yet, when we sin deliberately against God, the scriptures say we ought to be ashamed. When we sin against God individually, we ought to be ashamed. When we sin against God as a country, we ought to be ashamed. In this prayer, Daniel is confessing a pattern of sin. He talks about from generation to generation. In fact, Daniel is very specific. He names his sin and he uses very strong language. In our culture, if we make a mistake, when we sin, we say, oops, I goofed, or I blew it, or yeah, I have, I've made a few mistakes, or I have some areas in my life that are a little weak. But Daniel makes no excuse for sin. And he doesn't blame anyone else. He says, well, you know, our sin is really because of those, those dirty Babylon, Babylonians. Our sin is because of those miserable Philistines and the way they treated us years ago. We were led into sin by those Philistines that infiltrated us and, 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 and exposed us to their customs. With Daniel, there's no finger pointing. There's no blame game. There's no self-justification. Well, Lord, this is the reason why I sinned. Daniel says, I've sinned. We've sinned. And we've sinned repeatedly. And we've rebelled against you. And we've acted wickedly. There's no toning down or softening 
what they've done against God. You know, some have said that the three hardest words in the English language are, I was wrong. I don't know if you remember watching Happy Days many, many years ago <clears throat> and Richie Cunningham trying to get the Fonz to say, I was wrong. And the Fonz would start out, I was, I was, woo, 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 woo. And Richie would say, I was wrong. And Fonz would go, I was, woo, 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 woo. Not right. <laughs> he never could bring himself to say he was wrong, just that he wasn't right. But that's not enough. Many people are in trouble spiritually today because they're in denial. They're in denial of how sinful they are before God. And they haven't looked at the mirror recently and taken a reality check and to come clean about who we are before God. Daniel this morning makes it very clear to us that we've sinned against God. Thirdly, there is this agreement in verses 12 through 15. Having confessed the sins of the nation, Daniel goes on to declare that they deserve what happened to them. Three times he refers to the disaster that befell Israel in being taken into captivity by the Babylonians. His whole point in all this says, Lord, you promised us over and over and over and over and over again that if we sinned, you were going to discipline us. And if we sinned, we would be taken into captivity. We sinned, and you did what you said you would do. Daniel says, we have no complaint against you. We deserve what happened to us. How refreshing it is when compared to the self-justification that comes so easily to us. I think many times our prayers are hindered because we like to blame God for our problems. When things don't go our way, consciously or unconsciously, we think somehow God has let us down. And it isn't long when we think God has let us down that we become angry or bitter towards God. How much better would it be to say to God, in agreement with God, Lord, I don't understand everything that's happening to me in my life right now, but I know that you are a good God. And you are a God of mercy. And if, if it wasn't for you, I would have nothing. And I don't like all that's going on in my life, Lord. But I admit, I had a hand in bringing some of this about. Because I've sinned against you. And part of what's going on in my life is because of my own sinfulness. And I accept responsibility for my sinfulness. Forgive me, Lord. Daniel was bold enough to agree with God, saying, what's happened to the nation Israel, Lord? We deserve what we got. You told us that if we've sinned against you, you would discipline us because you loved us. You would discipline us as a father disciplines his son, and you've disciplined us. We have no complaint. When God acts in your life to discipline you or I, can we go before God and say, no complaint? Fourthly, the climax of the prayer. <clears throat> Verse 18. <clears throat> See the desolation of the city that bears your name. And again, in verse 19, O oh my God, do not delay because your city and your people bear your name. <clears throat> Why is Daniel praying as he does? Because of what he says in those final words. He's praying this prayer because he's saying, Lord, at a particular time in history, 
you created man and woman to bear your name and to bring glory to you in all of creation. Man sinned. Man rebelled against you. But you came to man again in the garden and you promised that from the seed of the woman would come one that would redeem man. And then you went to Abraham and you said to Abraham that from his seed you would raise up a nation from whom the Redeemer would come. And this nation would be your people and they would bear your name and they would bring honor and glory to you in all of creation so that when other nations would look at this nation that is going to be your nation, the other nations would know that you are the Lord God. But now, Lord, look at us. We've sinned against you. The people that bear your name were mocked. People make fun of us. The city that was to be your city, it's ruined. Your name is a laughing stock. Your people who were to be your people, we are now beggars. We're prisoners in Babylon. And so Daniel is saying, Lord, I take your holy name on my lips. I take your holy name on my lips because you are my God. And yet, I'm living here in Babylon where everyone is blaspheming your name. Lord, you designed us to be a people to bear your name and to bring glory. We haven't done that. But Lord, have mercy. And for the sake of your name, for the sake of your name, raise us up again. Use us once again to bring glory and honor to all the nations of the world. Let's pray that Jesus comes quickly. But while we wait for him to come, let's pray that God has mercy on us and raises us up once again. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you humbly even as David come, came. <clears throat> and Lord, we confess individually and as a nation that we have sinned against you in every way imaginable. We take unborn children and we murder them. We allow people in a relationship to marry outside of what you have ordained to be marriage as one man and one woman. We have minimized sexual sin. We've allowed pornography to grow. We've allowed ourselves to become greedy. And we've forgotten your name. Father, we confess that we are not the people you've called us to be. And so we pray, Father, this hour, not because you owe us anything, but because you love us and you're a God of mercy. We pray, have mercy on us. Because our desire, Father, is to see your name restored. We want people to give you honor and glory. We want your name to be honored in our government. We want your name to have glory in our schools. We want our lives to give testimony that Jesus is alive. Have mercy on us. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so he reminds the Lord, and he prays that God's glory and honor would once again be made manifest. That's why he's praying for Jerusalem. But it's at that point in history that 
Jerusalem was the physical point that was identified with God's people. We'll talk in a minute how Jerusalem is really picturing something else. But Daniel's desire is the same desire as ours. We live here in the United States and we say, Lord, this nation at one point used to bring you honor and glory. People knew that we were a Christian nation. Today, Father, far from that. We ought to take a look at Daniel's prayer and understand what Daniel's doing, and we ought to do the same. Lord, we've sinned against you, and what's happening to us has been brought on by ourselves. We are guilty. But Lord, Lord, for the sake of your name, for the sake of your honor, raise us up. Allow us to be the light on the hill once again. As you look through this prayer, you notice that it's based on God's character. Verse 4, you're awesome. You keep your promises. Verse 4, you're righteous. Verse 7, verse 9, you're a forgiving God. Verse 15, you have a great name. Verse 18, you are a merciful God. In many ways, verse 18 is the theme of the whole prayer. Let me read verse 18 to you. We do not make request of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. What a crucial insight that is. So many times we pray because we secretly think we've earned the right for God to give us what we want. Daniel takes the opposite track. He says, Lord, we don't deserve to even be heard by you because we've sinned greatly against you. The only reason I'm coming to you, Lord, is not because you owe it to me. I come to you because you are a God of love and grace and mercy. And I'm coming to you asking for your mercy. When we approach God with that attitude of confessing our sins and asking for his mercy, God leads us into his presence. God allows us to have fellowship with him. Daniel had lived all of his life in a pagan culture, in Babylon. The return to Jerusalem seemed an impossible fantasy. Yet the scripture said that in 70 years, the exile would end. And so the question is, the exile is going to end in 70 years. So what, what lies ahead for the people of God? Going back to Jerusalem? Is that what it was all about? Certainly they are going to go back to Jerusalem. Certainly they did go back to Jerusalem. But no lasting peace is really found just because you go back to a particular city and rebuild a city. That's not how you get peace. Hope does not lay in the land. Hope lays in the Lord who has promised to redeem his people. And so Daniel and all the people weren't to be looking at the city. They were to be looking at what the city represented. They were to be looking at Jesus. And Daniel's prayer ultimately was answered not in the return to Jerusalem, but in the coming of Jesus. It's for that reason that when you come to verse 24 and 27, that Gabriel speaks of the coming of Jesus. Daniel prays this beautiful prayer. At the end of his prayer, the angel Gabriel comes to visit him. And the angel Gabriel says, your prayer has been heard. And your prayer is going to be answered. And your prayer is going to be answered in a way that you will not even understand. Now, when people have tried to interpret these last verses, there are volumes and volumes of books written on what the 70 times 7 means. I'm not going to try to explain that to you this morning. 
what these verses are talking about? Because sometimes, sometimes when we read the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation, we get caught up in all the little particulars of what every number means. I think 70 times 7 is referring to the perfect time. It's a reference to in God's time. When God's time is complete, these things are going to happen. And the angel Gabriel lists six different things. Let me just list them for you. Transgressions will be finished. And so we think of Jesus when he came and he put transgressions away by his death upon the cross and he says, it is finished. Secondly, sin will be put to an end. The reality of the termination of guilt, condemnation, sin is complete because of Jesus. What do we read in Romans chapter 8? There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Wickedness will be atoned for. And so we have the sacrifice of Jesus atoning for the wickedness of sin. Gabriel mentions an everlasting righteousness will be brought in. And so when Jesus comes, Jesus brings his righteousness. So when you go to the book of Romans, what do you read? Romans chapter 6. You have been set free from sin and you've become a slave to righteousness. And through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. And fifthly, the types and figures of the Old Testament were to be done away, according to Gabriel. Why? Because all things have been fulfilled in Jesus. There is no longer a need for a temple. There's no not longer a need for sacrifice, the book of Hebrews teaches us, because Jesus has died once for all. And sixthly, Gabriel says God will send his anointed one. And so John baptizes Jesus in the river Jordan, anointing him and saying, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. This message that Gabriel gives to Daniel is a message of transgressions are going to be finished. We are going to get, the Messiah is going to put away sin. There's going to be atoning for wickedness. There's going to be an everlasting righteousness that will reach the ends of the earth. That prophecy has been fulfilled because his righteousness has reached the ends of the earth. You sit here today, thousands and thousands of miles from Babylon, and yet God's promise has been fulfilled because he sent Jesus to Bethlehem. The message of Jesus' birth, his death, his resurrection went out from Jerusalem and has even reached the little town of Dexter so that you can know the righteousness of God through Jesus. Prophecy of Daniel fulfilled. Today we're not looking towards the restoration of Jerusalem. We're not looking towards the restoration of Israel. Jerusalem and Israel, and you need to understand this. This is really, really important. Jerusalem and Israel were just a figure of what was to come. That figure, those types of the Old Testament have been fulfilled, and we are looking forward to the restoration of all things. We are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth. A day when the entire creation gives glory to God. Not just one city, but all of creation, even the pots in the kitchen. Sing holy unto the Lord. God is working his plan of redemption by bringing men and women to a relationship with him so that we might infiltrate the territories of Satan. We might erect signposts that God rules, that God is king, and that in our testimony that God is king, we might be a light to the world so that all of creation gives God glory and honor. We, like David, need to pray, Lord, have mercy. We have sinned, but for the sake of your name, for the sake of your honor, allow us to be a light once again. Allow us to be a light individually. Allow us to be a light as a community allow us to be a light as a nation. So let me ask you, how goes the name of God? Is there shame being poured on God's name? 
Do people think of Christians as a lost cause? Do they identify us as followers of Jesus, as the defeated, as people who are pursuing a lost cause? To the world, is God's name virtually extinct? Are we yesterday's men and women? If so, then we need to pray like Daniel. And we need to pray that God would act. Take the initiative, Lord. Take the initiative. Your honor and your glory is at stake, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, for the sake of your name and for your glory. Have mercy on us. Use us once again.